Solutions.com. 21st Century Radio is sponsored by Hieronymus and Company. Now more of 21st Century Radio with your host, Dr. Zoe Hieronymus. It's all about soul. It's all about faith and a deeper devotion. It's all about soul. Because under love is a stronger emotion. Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Laura Cortner is our executive producer, and Anita Brockington runs our board. Humans are not the only animals entitled to recognition and protection of their fundamental rights. The Non-Human Rights Project is the only civil rights organization in the United States working through litigation, public policy advocacy, and education to secure legally recognized fundamental rights for non-human animals. They work towards their goal in three key ways, through litigation, public policy, and education. NHRP president of Non-Human Rights Project, Kevin Schneider, is our guest this hour. And he shows us that as an animal protection attorney, that the legal thinghood of all non-human animals is the single most important factor preventing humans from vindicating their interests. The few animal protection laws that exist are weak, apply only to certain species in certain circumstances, and grant the animals themselves no rights whatsoever. Animal welfare statutes don't provide recourse against the mental and physical suffering that results from depriving self-aware, autonomous beings of their freedom, the company of others of their kind, and their natural habitats. Join us this hour to learn more about their efforts worldwide and how academicians, litigators, judges, and activists are declaring that sentient animals are deserving of legal protection from deprivation, abuse, torture, kidnapping, murder, to name a few of the rights humans are afforded that our animal kin are not. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Um, You know, Gay Bradshaw, who's a dear friend of mine who runs the Carulos organization out in Jacksonville, Argonne, told me about your work, I think, a few years ago. And um, if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about, I, I read somewhere in your literature that Stephen Wise began this effort to gain rights for non-human animals in 1985. That's like more than 40 years ago. Do you know the story of his first efforts? Oh, I I know them. I know them very well. And uh, just not to be a nitpicker, but uh, Steve is still uh, very much involved. He's he's actually the president. Oh, okay. uh, And I'm the executive director. Oh, (laughs) uh, yeah, that's important. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. All right. I've I've had that post for about three years and for about uh, five years before that, I was a volunteer. And really, this is the issue that animated me to go to law school, you know, reading Steve's books. Uh, 1985, coincidentally, is the same year I was born, uh, 32 years ago. Wow. Uh, that's when Steve really uh, decided that this issue of the thinghood, as you put it, of all non-human animals uh, would, would stymie, you know, any other effort. As long as we are not confronting that fundamental issue uh, we're going to be limited in what we can do for for any animal. Uh, so that that really was the um, you know the genesis of this of this idea. And it was only in 2013, after decades of of primarily Steve, you know, being the the real driver of this, teaching classes, writing books, doing talks, giving lectures, um, practicing other in other areas, but really preparing for this first case in 2013, December 2013 in New York, uh, when we filed habeas corpus petitions on behalf of every chimpanzee within the state of New York. Uh, There were four of them at the time. And, uh, you know, that was the first time in the United States that um, anyone had demanded such a right on behalf of an animal. And it's transformative because you're not asking for something like an animal welfare statute or even the Federal Endangered Species Act to be, um, you know, to be exercised. That there are many people who do that. Uh, What we're asking for is fundamentally different, that you recognize that for the first time, this non-human animal can, um, again, be a person. But what does a person mean? Person, we often think human being, but in the eyes of the law, person takes on a very different meaning. It's not biological at all. That's why it makes sense for a corporation to be a person, 
a city, a state to be a person. In other countries, we're starting to see environmental features be declared persons. Rivers in New Zealand and in India, although that's um, been reversed, it's on appeal. But more to the point, more recently, the Amazon rainforest was declared a legal person by the Supreme Court of Colombia. And so all of these ideas, you know, they just drive home the fact that a person and a human being are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Really what it means is we call it a person is, is really a container for rights because, you know, our system is kind of crude, right? We're no, no one's here to say that our rough uh, kind of evolved, uh, you know, the legal system, the common law in particular, it, it moves in stages. And from time to time, uh, it's necessary to, to push out those boundaries because if we look at the the, the contours of personhood itself. It's instructive. Uh, not that long ago, women were not full persons under the law. Children, certainly African Americans as slaves in the United States, were treated literally as things and traded as things. And the only real way to ever address um, you know, the most grievous harms that are done in a fundamental and lasting, substantial way is to address this thinghood problem. And so... That's what uh, that's what Steve set out to do. And and just by sheer force of will and, and, and never, you know, just never giving up uh, over time, we've watched the legal culture, um, the judicial culture, the academic culture really evolve to catch up with the ideas that have remained the same since, uh, you know, really since Steve started and others working uh, contemporaries alongside him, uh, folks like Tom Reagan. Who's, who's cited in a, a recent court decision that we can talk about? That's very exciting. Yeah, why don't so, you? Why don't we jump right to it? Because there's so many. I have so many questions about your clients, whether it's Tommy the chimpanzee or Kiko, a former animal former, or the elephants, Beulah, Karen, and Minnie that you represent. I mean, these are your clients. And um, tell tell us about the success that you are about to, and what's happening. Then we'll come back to how you choose your clients and and what precedents have been set. Sure. Happy to do that. So there are really two that uh, two court cases, decisions that uh, stand out in our New York litigation. Uh, so just for context, uh, we started in December 2013 with our first lawsuits. And um, we've been only focused in New York up until late last year when, uh, as you mentioned, Beulah, Minnie and Karen, they're in Connecticut. So we're right now litigating in two states. So in 2015, after um, having gone up and down the appeals court on our first round of habeas corpus petitions, uh, we filed a, a second on behalf of uh, two young chimpanzees named Hercules and Leo who were being held and used in locomotion research at Stony Brook uh, University out on Long Island in New York, the state university. And unlike all of the judges before, uh, because with habeas corpus, um, the really – fundamental thing to understand. It's this ancient common law writ, one of the kind of oldest in our Western English derived tradition of law. And it means produce the body in Latin. And so either the party who's detained, the prisoner, or somebody acting on their behalf, because that's a well-recognized right, will bring a petition before court. So, so before you being... go too fast, so habeas corpus, I, I took this from your website, is, quote, a centuries old means of testing the lawfulness of one's imprisonment before court. And then you go on to say it was used a lot in 18th and 19th centuries to fight human slavery. Um, so at this point, then, in the common law courts should do the same. You're saying that the common law court should do the same for your non-human clients. That's right. Too. Okay. And that's the, really the beauty of the common law is that it moves, that it keeps up with scientific discovery, moral awakenings, kind of developments of all kinds. That's really what it's meant to do. And so we were going up and down, running into brick walls for the first time. We got a judge in 2015 to order a hearing. And this was not like other you know, animal cases in the past where the party bringing the case is maybe an organization on behalf for, you know, trying to enforce a law for the benefit of animals. This hearing was issued in the name of Hercules and Leo. For the first time that we know of anywhere, certainly in the United States, a judge ordered a hearing directly in the name of two non-human animals. And that was really a, a monumental turning point uh, for a lot of um, kind of technical legal reasons. But the main point is that 
you know, you had this judge taking this issue uh, quite seriously. And, and indeed, in her written decision, she came very close to order, or ordering the relief that we sought. She felt herself bound by an appellate decision in a previous case that we had filed. But nonetheless, she wrote a stirring opinion. She said, you know, the time for this is is coming. You know, this is not an issue that is that is going to go away. And more to the point, uh, earlier this year, um, in a separate appeal that we've been fighting in New York for the last couple of years, uh, the highest court in the state of New York, the Court of Appeals, um, they denied our appeal, which happens in 95, 96 percent of the cases that attempt to go before that court, much like the U.S. Supreme Court. They exercise their discretion. And they don't have to say anything when they do that, and oftentimes they don't. They just say denied. But a judge, a sitting judge, Eugene Fahey, on that the highest court in New York, uh, took it upon himself to write a six-page opinion in which he went to great lengths to essentially endorse, uh, we think, the arguments that we've been making. And while he didn't take up the case and his compatriots on the court didn't take up the case for really a technical procedural reason, uh, because we see that a lot, you know, you use these essentially legal obstacles to avoid the real merits of the case. But he took it upon himself to to jump right into the merits. He said that these other appellate courts in New York, three of them uh, that had ruled against us were all wrong for the various reasons that they ruled on. They were all wrong. And, you know, again, said that this was a profound and far reaching issue that speaks to our relationship, not just with chimpanzees, but with all of the life on Earth around us. Yeah. Because, again, he recognized, which for us was a thrilling thing, uh, because although, again, on paper, it looks like a loss for us, we now feel even more emboldened uh, with this opinion in hand, because for us, it makes crystal clear this is not a frivolous issue. We have a judge in Connecticut, for example, that is maintaining that our case is indeed frivolous, uh, having no merit, which is quite shocking in in the light of, you know, the state right next door. Uh, More to the point, uh, in Argentina, uh, just a couple of years ago, a judge uh, in response to a habeas corpus petition, much like our own, ordered a chimpanzee uh, released from a zoo to a sanctuary and declared her a non-human legal person with this right to bodily liberty in the context. So this is something that indeed is is happening. And a lot of the judges that we encounter um, want to, there's a certain level of willful ignorance to, uh, or kind of shutting their eyes to yeah. developments outside the U.S. in particular. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this, uh, we see it as kind of a dam and, and the water is, is building up. And it's, it seems to us only a matter of time. Uh, before uh, we begin to see bro- breaks in this wall that that we call it between uh, that that would make all that does make all humans persons categorically and all non humans things. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing that's so interesting about the work that you all do at the non human rights um, project is it reminds me a little bit of what Earth Justice does on behalf of rivers and mountains and fish. And, you know, that these things are entitled to. Um, that's right. We're integrity. And what it's kind of interesting. I mean, so these two uh, um, chimpanzees, Hercules and Leo, were used in animal experimentations at a research center at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette. And then they leased them to Stony Brook's University's Department of Anatomical Sciences. And they're very young. And they for they were what put in um the lab and used for research about how humans stood up and they were anesthetized and tortured, basically. And then what happened? So it's uh, kind of a long and torturous tale. You mentioned uh, really the notorious New Iberia Research Center in Louisiana. Uh, They're essentially a breeding facility or were. Uh, There have since been legal changes. The Endangered Species Act now includes captive chimpanzees. And so um, at this point, you know, the, it seems that the, the kind of industry for testing on chimpanzees is more or less dead in the United States, finally, although yeah. uh, there are some caveats to that. Uh, so they were born there at a very young age. It's not, I don't believe that they were really used in experiments at New Iberia, being so young. 
they were shipped out at a very young age to Stony Brook. Right. And once there, uh, they were subjected to monthly anesthesia. They had electrodes inserted into their muscles. Um, and then they were made to walk a back and forth uh, so that uh, to essentially create maps of their movements um, that researchers would study. And the proposed aim, and all of this is, is laid out in a video that the BBC uh, actually did on this research, uh, because for them it was, you know, for us it's, it's almost absurd to watch it because it's presented in a straight-faced way as almost normal, right? Just, yeah. no, you know, have them walk back and forth. And we learn that, you know, chimps swing their hips wider than humans than when they walk. Well, yeah, I, I think a child maybe could tell you that from watching a little bit of video footage. Uh, so for us, it was just completely unjustified. But of course, you know, that doesn't, that's besides the point for us. Uh, we don't, and we make very clear, address welfare. Of course, we're concerned about it, and it's intertwined uh, with rights in a lot of ways. But there is a categorical difference between welfare and fundamental rights in the same way that if a child was kidnapped, uh, and you brought a claim, a habeas or something similar to recover them, you wouldn't be concerned with their welfare. You'd be concerned with simply getting them out of where they are, where they're being detained. That's the first priority. Well, and, and, and I thought in this case it was interesting that you all were working through this case that Justice Barbara Jaffe, as your website shares, ordered the state university's legal representative, which is the New York Attorney General's office, to appear in court and justify their detainment. And then five months later... The NIRC took Hercules and Leo back to Louisiana, where they remained in captivity for two and a half years before they got transferred to the Project Chimps. That's right. And, and there was quite a lot of back and forth interplay uh, negotiations between us, um, Save the Chimps, which is an excellent sanctuary in, in Florida, South Florida, that's been willing and able to accept Hercules and Leo and all of our chimpanzee clients uh, from day one. And for a time, it looked that they would actually uh, just be moved there. Um, it kind of got more complicated than from there. Um, and as you said, they're currently at Project Chimps. So, you know, the situation has, has uh, you know, changed, not completely resolved. But, uh, you know, for now, it, it certainly uh, appears uh, better than uh, being at New Iberia. However, uh, you know, as far as their legal case, uh, without with them being outside the state of New York, uh, you know, those efforts are are complicated. But, you know, we're always monitoring the situation because when we indeed take on a client, we take that obligation seriously and we do all that we can to see that through. It's it's, it's wonderful. I, I am so grateful for the work that you're doing and the precedence that you're starting to to create in the world. We'll be right back. Our guest is Kevin Schneider, Executive Director of the Non-Human Rights Project. Find out more about their work, see how you might help. Go to www.nonhumanrights.org. This is Lisa Radov, Chair of Maryland Votes for Animals, Help us pass laws protecting animals. Visit us on the web at voteanimals.org. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Kevin Schneider is with us. He is not the president. He is the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. If you missed the introduction, they are the only civil rights organization in the United States working through litigation, public policy, advocacy, and education to secure legally recognized fundamental rights for non-human animals. So I was interested in, I want to come back to, given that you're an attorney, uh, this writs of, of habeas corpus, because I was reading how these two chimpanzees, Tommy and Kiko, is that right? That's right. Um, that when you all entered into the court, uh, habeas corpus on their behalf, the reason for denying it to them is because they, quote, are not homo sapiens. So uh, that's an interesting question, uh, because there have been a number of reasons offered uh, by the courts. Indeed, Tommy and Kiko have never had a hearing uh, issued 
on their behalf, ordered on their behalf in the way that Hercules and And, and tell, us, tell us a little bit about Tommy and Kiko so people sure. understand. Yeah, so it's um, so the first Tommy decision is, is kind of the most uh, loaded, I think, and, and kind of the one we've spent the most time over the last couple of years, um, along with others, philosophers, lawyers, professors, attacking, is this idea that... Uh, which is really, a, we think, a thinly veiled um, way of saying that only humans get rights. Right, the, except for corporations. <laughs> right, well, we can talk about that, too. That's Another that, day. Right? I think another uh, day. Yeah, so this, this court, the third appellate division, told us um, that only um, those who are capable of bearing duties and responsibilities um, can have rights, basically saying that the ability to bear duties and responsibilities is a prerequisite for rights. And that is for a lot of reasons that we probably don't have time to get very deep into, but on our website we do, is wildly wrong. It's, it's unprincipled and frankly dangerous. Uh, as, as many scholars and philosophers and others have pointed out, you know, that definition would exclude billions of human beings, yeah. children, comatose, those with Alzheimer's. I mean, you can imagine... And plus, you know, this is a rather nebulous standard to begin with. Yeah, and it's, as you point out, it's rather irrelevant to their personhood. Indeed, it is. Indeed. And the uh, there's one document, I think, in particular that, that uh, is of interest uh, that was on our website. We had 17 North American philosophers all over the United States and Canada. They wrote a joint, uh, what's called an amicus curie brief, basically a big, long brief uh, to the court. Uh, making a very detailed argument about why all of these, you know, conceptions of personhood that have been offered by the courts or, you know, rejections of our argument are wrong. And indeed, that seemed to be uh, a turning point in getting Judge Fahey, the, the New York High Court judge I mentioned, to issue this ruling earlier this year in which he really validated the arguments that we've been making in the in the justice of of. Uh, recognizing or at least, you know, considering the the personhood of non-human animals in a serious way. And so one of the things you talk about in some of your campaign work is that um, self-awareness and autonomy become the starting point. Meaning That's for right. being able yep. to show that they have personhood. Yes. And so that's a really interesting concept because we make very clear at every turn we try to, that autonomy is a sufficient but not a necessary characteristic. We mm -hmm. are not, you know, acting as if we have the list. There is no list, I think. Uh, the common law should not impose a list. It should be open. It should be, remain flexible. The reason that we focus on autonomy is because courts profess a lot, a strong belief in autonomy. You go back over hundreds of years of cases, it is one of the central values of Western law. What American does it law. actually mean from a legal point of view? So it's the ability to choose how to live one's own life. Okay. And indeed, that's why it is at the heart of habeas corpus, really, when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because a deprivation of autonomy as a child is being grounded. As an adult, it's being put in jail. It's one of, we think, it's the worst, about one of the worst punishments we humans have come up with for each other, and indeed for non-human animals, is to completely deprive you of your ability to make any decision about your day-to-day -day life. And to, for beings who are like chimpanzees and elephants, and indeed I'm sure science will continue to show us many others, they have an interest in autonomy that is at least, you know, on par with our own. Of course it's different, but at a very fundamental level, we're, we're not talking about really a human right. This is something that is, that is shared this interest in autonomy is shared beyond species. And it's as clear as day I mean, to a child. When you contain an animal, or indeed a, your brother or your sister, and you thwart them, they're going to resist pretty quickly. And, you know, this is something that I think is pretty intuitive uh, to most people. And so as lawyers, we have to go in there armed with arguments that will stick. We need a hook, essentially, to hang our hat on. We can't just go in and say, chimpanzees use sign language and they're they're awesome and they make me feel great to watch them those things may be true and may work in some way but legally speaking uh, it's meaningless and so we have tons of case law on our side 
And, you know, one is interesting illustration of autonomy um, that we often cite to is a case where, say, you have somebody who is nearing, is on their deathbed in a hospital, and the doctors come in and say that there's a pill or a surgery that will save their life, and they refuse it. They say they don't want it. They're a sound mind, and they reject it. And the hospital sues, essentially goes to court and tries to get an order allowing them to commit what is essentially an assault, an right. unwanted touching of this patient. And the courts have held, certainly in New York and Connecticut, and routinely uh, across the country, that indeed the autonomy of that person of sound mind to reject this outweighs the state's interest in keeping them alive and the hospital's interest in keeping them alive. That's how much we respect and cherish autonomy. Mm -hmm. And habeas corpus is has kind of two main things going for it in this regard. It is tied in with autonomy. It's such a basic I and see. fundamental thing, uh, you know, a right that is shared demonstrably um, beyond our own species. And the second is that it is one of the few remaining uh, legal vehicles in the United States where you can actually get into common law. And really all that common oh, law is is the law that judges make, as opposed to what has become... Uh, far more common over the years, the you know generations, uh, statutory law passed by Congress or state, you know, House of uh, Representatives and so forth, and um, state bills and city bills. But there do remain these pockets of common law, and when you're in there, there's, you know, history shows they have a, a certain toolkit, and among those is the ability to transform a legal thing to a legal person to vindicate at least this one fundamental right to bodily liberty. And, and, and you know, and I think what's interesting about some of the comments you all have made and that you do education and you have a variety of vehicles for advancing this course of um, hopefully liberation and, and an evolution of human consciousness is that it's happening in academia. And my dear friend, Dr. Gay Bradshaw, who's done so much to advance um, transspecies psychology, showing that the science shows us that these are sentient, autonomous beings um, that have family and ritual and history and memory and play and love and grieving and et cetera, um, that even right down to the brain um, functioning of animals and humans, that you can't really separate the two. I mean, it's just so interesting. And I love that you point out that it's really not a radical view in legal academia that some non-human animals, at least, are entitled to at least some legal rights. And that that and you point out, and I think it's really true, and I just find it so interesting that it's like it can take decades of, um, you know, the notions being understood by people who take all their time to study, be they philosophers or legal ethicists or whatever, that generally it's academia that precedes these legal and political changes, as you point out, they did from gay marriage to gun rights to minority viewpoints, et cetera. Yeah, indeed. And, and we uh, consciously model ourselves, uh, particularly on the, the gay marriage movement, um, that too began with litigation and, you know, litigation, um, it's almost, I don't want to say it's uniquely American, but it, you know, Americans seem to really love it as much as you complain about it. I think it's this kind of two-sided fight, this battle of ideas. Um, there is something compelling about it, but for us, it also helps, um, drive interest. And so that becomes, you know, kind of the, the center of, of so much, so much more around it. You mentioned the education, but also uh, we're now doing um, preparing our first legislative campaigns. I can't go into too much detail about where those will be, but I can say they will be in California, likely to begin, and uh, moving from from there. And and, and, and can moving, I interrupt yeah. you just for one moment? Because there's another thing Dr. Bradshaw once said on our program that. Um, I have come back to over and over again and in my own book cited is that I never realized until she just pointed it out that academia itself is built on the use of animals, meaning the whole industry of research and, you know, study is, is has for so long been based on the right to use animals in any way you please, whether it's a monkey or a rabbit or a rat or a, you know, a dog or a cat or a, and that, that, I, I think that I just didn't really appreciate the degree to which the whole economy of academia is based on the abuse of animals. 
Well, I mean, I would take it further and say our entire culture, our species is built on that premise. Well, that's true. In so many ways that are really kind of mind numbing. It is. And that kind of gets into, you know, how certainly I and many others were uh, gravitated to this work. You know, for me, it seemed clear that in order to begin, uh, you know, to have a lever to really address broader scale issues, you know, some people might say, well, all this for a handful of chimpanzees and we are looking to transform their lives, but the precedent that would be set, that is being set, um, they become really ambassadors for millions, billions exactly. of other billions of animals. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I remember that whole thing about factory farming, that torturous, abusive system, um, that there were no laws to protect farm animals. You could protect a dog, but not a cow. Yeah, and that's one of the that's indeed one of the uh, revelations that I had, you know, probably a decade or more ago, that really led me to s- decide that the law was what I needed to to do uh, mm-hmm. to, to try to make some dent in this, you know, massive really infrastructure of uh, yeah. death and suffering. That what is and, death and suffering? On yeah, this, you know, categorical lack of rights. And when you think about rights and the expansion of them, it, it in a lot of ways is a challenge to our imaginations, but in a more, in another way, it's, um, it's us like, look at climate science is analogous in this way, trying to really force the acceptance of science of reality, what it's telling us. And in the case of these non-humans, it's telling us, look, we are not the only beings that have an interest in these, in these fundamental rights. And to, to simply to simply ignore that it undermines our own notions of justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and indeed, that's what we those are the arguments. And stewardship, that we make you know, it's like whatever happened to this notion of a human being a steward rather than an abuser and a user. Look, we're going to take a little break. Um, you have fascinating things to say. I could talk all night about this, but we only have about 20 minutes left, and we'll be right back. Kevin Schneider, Executive Director of the Non-Human Rights Project. They are the only civil rights organization in the United States working through litigation, public policy, advocacy, and education to secure legally recognized fundamental rights for non-human animals. Go to www.nonhumanrights.org. Hello, this is Dr. Gay Bradshaw. I'm the executive director of the Carulo Center, www.carulos.org, K-E-R-U-L-O-S.org. Our organization is dedicated to bringing dignity and freedom for all animals. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Sohara Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Kevin Schneider is with us. He's the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. Learn about their work at www.carulos.org nonhumanrights.org. Now, there are other countries where people are working on these same issues, and I know you all work with groups in England and Spain and France and Sweden, Portugal, Argentina, Israel, Turkey, India, etc. Has any other country acknowledged this issue of and made an animal and and, and have they won a, I'm, or I'm really tired. <laughs> that they've won a case where an animal has been changed from a thing to a person. So as I mentioned, there was uh, in Argentina, uh, a habeas corpus petition brought on behalf of a chimpanzee named Cecilia. And in November, 2016, uh, the judge there, trial court judge issued a ruling indeed declaring Cecilia to be a non-human legal person. So we were tremendously excited about that. We had it, professionally translated, uh, which is like everything else that we've ever filed uh, is on our website. And we brought that to the attention of the courts of New York, again, mostly to silence, Mm -hmm. uh, really just refusing to even uh, consider it or obliquely saying something like, well, uh, you know, we don't point non-human rights project doesn't point to any cases within the U.S., seeking the result, uh, but indeed in Argentina. And as I mentioned, there are other, uh, you know, similar developments in the environmental context that are uh, beginning to 
really take root with indeed declarations, judicial declarations of legal entity or legal person status, uh, which again is just the capacity to have a right. Um, so it's almost like allowing a forest to be something like a corporation, ironically allowing Am the, the Amazon to be like Amazon, mm -hmm. which when you think about it is, is really not crazy at all with all we're learning uh, by the day scientifically. Even if you don't you know, have a sense of the value of a river, a chimpanzee, a chicken, any being for her own sake, uh, there is just more evidence by the day that you know, this is what we rely on. You know, that thing that you call the swamp is now a wetland and, you know, is, is seen as vital for preventing hurricanes and stormwater runoff. And yeah. All you, of these you, different Well, benefits. doesn't it seem to you that we've commodified everything and in doing so divorced ourselves from the actual living, um, breathing spirit that is alive in all things, making all things important, all things connected to each other. I know from my own experience, when we had to take down a tree that had died um, and removed it, three other trees nearby died, and they weren't sick. But it, there's a beautiful book out called The Hidden Life of Trees about all of this, but the, the interconnectedness of all things. So when you work, I, I'm not familiar enough with how... The court process works, but if you keep going into New York and you're, do you keep going before the same judge? I mean, if a judge rules poorly at one time, don't you hope to like get it out of their court and try it again with another judge? So we've actually been in front of quite a few different judges uh, in New York, and you really cannot pick and choose your judges. You can choose which uh, courthouse, uh, you know, which county yeah. to file in. Um, and indeed, with Justice Jaffe, uh, it's kind of an illustrative example. In 2015, after she ordered the hearing for Hercules and Leo, uh, she sits in, in Manhattan in New York County, uh, in that same courthouse that you see in the background of law and order all the time, a big, very striking one. And so we figured, well, we'll file these cases on Tommy and Kiko's behalf in the same court. Uh, because, you know, there are rules of what's called judicial economy. If a judge has heard an issue, mm -hmm. for the most part, they'll give it back to that same judge. They call that judicial economy. I love that. <laughs> yeah, judicial economy. Yep. And um, and indeed, that did happen with both of them. But uh, to our surprise, uh, we were uh, denied on both of them. Indeed, those were the two cases that formed the appeal that led to that Fahey uh, opinion that I mentioned that is this is really a quite positive sign for us. But um, yeah, so there's really not much picking and choosing we can do. Mm -hmm. um, there are all sorts of strategic and tactical considerations that uh, that go into these decisions of where to file, when to file. But, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a mix of art and science. And, and we've learned over and over again that every time we try to predict what a given judge is going to do. We are oftentimes wrong, sometimes pleasantly surprised, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, more, maybe more often not so. But there is, you know, and it's funny, sometimes we get asked by reporters, so you've been denied, you know, three, four times now, when is the non-human rights project just going to give up? <laughs> Which to us, we can't help but laugh at because, you know, the, the thinghood, this issue of the thinghood of all animals that we're up against, it's at least 2,000 years old. It's, as we've mentioned, so entrenched in every aspect of our society in so many ways that we just don't even And the way we appreciate. treat the earth, yeah. We're so abusive to everything and everyone, and it's just, um, you know, it's just tragic what's happening on our planet. So when you then look at the way in which you are moving forward, and I have to say under this current administration, the courts is the only place I have hope. I have to be honest, as an activist my whole life and as a commentator and broadcaster and researcher, that in I, I don't have any faith right now in the Congress, in the House or the Senate, but I have faith in all of those who, like yourself and Earthwatch who are advancing these court cases. It seems to be the only place where we're having some success in standing up against this just tidal wave of... Um, just demonic action. I don't know what else to call it. It certainly isn't helping anybody or anything. Well, I, I share that. Um, and indeed, that's what 
one of the things that attracted me to to the law in this type of this approach in particular, especially the common law. Yeah. Right. You're you're just kind of in some ways cutting out the legislative process. But there's another, uh, I think, interesting thing and somewhat hopeful, maybe silver lining uh, that I think recent events the last couple of years in the current administration have invigorated a even at the city level. Indeed, the legislative efforts that we are about to begin launching begin at the city level, the mm-hmm. municipal level. Mm-hmm. And there's interesting uh, precedent for that right now in, for example, uh, large cities that have made a pledge to um, essentially act like the Paris Climate Accord right. were still in place and basically pretend that you know Trump didn't pull out of it, which I think is in a lot of ways, a, a necessary and positive thing for people to kind of... Oh, I agree with you entirely. Them, it's like, invigorated. In, <laughs> yeah, local activism. That, yeah. You know, that there's this king that's going to solve all their problems because, I don't know, that's that's kind of, I think, you know, this sense of... Uh, Regaining the sense of how much power really is within people at, a, at even a local level. I agree with I you. Think is a powerful and thing. That's exactly as an activist what I say now. You know, act locally, focus locally. It doesn't mean we can't be citizens of the world and care about the whole planet, but if everybody in each of their locales, no matter where they live on earth, are focused, then we do it place by place. Um, and so you have other clients, for instance, these Asian elephants who we all know, and I've done stories on this, who are controlled by abuse and these horrible flesh-piercing bullhawk hooks and chains, et cetera, et cetera, in Connecticut. So Beulah, Karen, and Minnie, where is their case? So uh, we filed our first, in November of last year, we filed the first petition on their behalf uh, in Connecticut. And uh, the day after Christmas of last year, we got uh, the denial from the judge there. And this one, um, not to delve too much into the legal technicalities, but uh, said that we did not have standing, essentially saying that we, as the Non-Human Rights Project, did not have the right to assert this claim on behalf of the three elephants. And then he also, the judge, ruled that our claim that they should be persons for this limited purpose of habeas corpus and their bodily liberty uh, was frivolous, frivolous on its face uh, in legal terms is what he said. And so ever Mm -hmm. since we got that, we've been in the appeals process, which is where we really live uh, so much. And and that's really been known from day one that, you know, these it's not like you're going to walk into a trial court and just get what you want. And even if you do, it's going to go up on appeal. So this issue has to be digested. And I think New York is a good example of that. You know, you had four plus years of essentially the legal system there digesting this very new mm-hmm. complex idea. And, and, and now we're finally starting to, I think, see that bear fruit. But it is, of course, a, um, a slow process. But there are, I think, indeed, uh, lots of milestones to, to point to. And so in Connecticut next door, um, we have this appeal going on. And while that's happening, we just went ahead uh, recently and filed a second petition on their behalf. We're allowed to do so under the Connecticut rules and law. And so while we have this first appeal pending on a number of different issues that are covered in detail on our website on the litigation page, um, we have a, a fresh appeal going. And so we're waiting now to, or I should say, fresh petition. And we're waiting now to hear what the judge is going to do. He can either dismiss us on the same grounds or some other grounds, or he can, as Justice Jaffe did in New York with Hercules and Leo, issue the hearing and order the, quote, owners of the elephants, the Comerford Zoo, to come to court and defend their detention of these three elephants. And so essentially what the judge would be doing in that instance is Uh, assuming without deciding that the elephants could be persons uh, to hear, because that's what we want. We want want the arguments. We don't want a one-sided fight. And, uh, you know, I should mention, because we've been talking about the Jaffe hearing, uh, the work of the Non-Human Rights Project and Steve Wise uh, was the subject of a HBO documentary in 2016. It's uh, still on HBO. It's called Unlocking the Cage. And it was done by uh, Chris Hedges and D.A. Pennybaker, who are two of the most 
yeah, wonderful. Uh, decorated uh, filmmakers, documentary filmmakers ever because they they just heard Steve out. They listened yeah. to him talk for three, four hours. And they had recently lost their dog. And so I think they had this, I don't know, this sense of how profound this, this was. And so they followed us with their cameras. And one of the things they captured was indeed this, this hearing for Hercules and Leo. We oh, how wonderful. I look forward to watching it. It's called Unlocking Steve, the Chains. Unlocking the Cage. The Cage. Uh-huh. It's um, on HBO. Uh, I think, you know, you can find it on iTunes. You can find it on, uh, it's been on the BBC. It's, it's, it's been seen by, we calculate, uh, you know, well over a million, millions of people all over the world. It's been actually led to the creation of a, what we might call a sister organization in South Korea. They saw... <laughs> subtitled version of the film and decided to create uh, oh, wonderful. An it's like I group. know of um, Jill Robinson's group um, Animal Asia a- Animals Asia is that what it's called yeah yeah and she does such a beautiful work like even with the elephants and teaching May Huts how to work with them without the bull hulks you don't have to torture and break them to have a relationship <laughs> with an animal well you know your work is stunning and um, one last question how can people contribute if they want to donate money Well, that's always appreciated. Uh, We're always looking to expand our staff and be able to file suits in more places. So you can go to our website. That's the easy way. All right. Uh, Non-human rights. Mm -hmm. www.nonhumanrights.org. Very good. Well, I'm going to have to say good night and wish you all the best on behalf of all the sentient life that is on our earth. I'm in total harmony with your efforts and congratulations on doing so. Stimulating talk and breaking news on Talk Radio 680 WCBM, Baltimore, and WCBM.com.